Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is actually double good stuff because we got two authors today. And this is one is going down the ebook series. And I'm super happy to have ebook authors Cole Miller and Nick Nicholas Eunice with us today. Hey, Cole. Hi, Nico. Hey, Frank. How's it? Uh, Nico, where are you located at? I am in beautiful Illinois in uh, Urbana Champaign oh, yes. by the cornfield. Yes. Uh, yes. So is the corn is the corn started yet? Is it is it coming out of the ground yet? Does it ever end? <laughs> <laughs> There's always corn. Uh, yeah, no, they've cut it all down and it's beginning to grow slowly. But you know, oh, very cool. Very uh, cool. We will have enough corn very soon to be able to go into a maze, and you know. Well, I like tortillas, so you know we can make some homemade tortillas. So we'll have to head out no, there. No, I, I don't think they grow that kind of corn. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's mostly for feed. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Very cool. And Cole, where are you located at? I'm in College Park, Maryland, near Washington, D.C., and we're starting to get a bit of a break in the weather. It's actually beginning to look like late spring as opposed to winter. Awesome. And I am in Phoenix on this May 16th, 2022, as we shoot this. And somebody turned on the power switch yesterday. And so we easily cleared 100F yesterday. Um, and so, yeah, summer's here in the desert. <laughs> Very cool. Um, I'm going to assume that both of you, or people know that both of you guys do research in gravitational waves uh, in assorted topics and things like that. Um, and so what, what gave you the idea to do an ebook? on the topic. How did that pop up? Yeah, so for many years I've been posting lecture notes, especially on the grad classes on my website. And I've therefore on occasion gotten contacted by people wondering if I want to turn it into a book. So in this particular case, I was contacted by an IOP representative wondering about gravitational waves. And this sounded interesting. The thing is that I am, however, Socratically aware of my ignorance about a lot of different aspects of gravitational waves. And since I'd worked very productively with Nico before, I thought the best thing to do would be to see if he was willing to do it because we complement each other very well. And I don't mean we say that we're, each other is great. I mean, complement in the sense of what do you mean by this? And can't you explain it better? Which is the what you want when it comes to a book. So luckily for me, he agreed and we were able to work on it together and it was a very enjoyable experience. Cool, cool. Yeah. Uh, and Nico, how long did it take from when Cole first approached you to when we saw the finished product? Was that like a one week exercise, a two week exercise? <laughs> no, so it took a little while. Um, you know, the hardest part was to find time for us to actually be able to work on mm -hmm. the book while also teaching classes, doing research and, you know, doing service for the university. All while, you know, LIGO kept on discovering new uh, events and doing very exciting science and then NICER getting <laughs> results and Cole was very involved in that. And, yeah. you know, even Horizon Telescope taking pictures of black holes, uh, you know. The, the era of, of gravitational, well, of gravitational data, I would say, uh, is uh, really at a at a peak right now. I mean, it's mm. golden age, mm. if you want. Um, and so, uh, it's hard to find time, uh, you know, to, to get to writing uh, books, uh, textbooks, popular books. But you know, once we uh, started chatting, it was what like about eighteen months, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. um, there were, you know, periods of, of intense writing where we were like, we are all both free, like, let's write now. And then we like typing frantically and, and trying to, uh, you know, we would get confused uh, and then we'd have to like relearn things we had already learned or, mm -hmm. or learn new things we didn't know about before. And then there would be periods where, you know, I would write something and, and Cole wouldn't understand it or Cole would write something and I wouldn't understand it. And then we would try to explain the content to each other <laughs> good, good, <laughs> and then good. think about, you know, well, if we don't get it, surely the students are not going to get it either. <laughs> and then how do you explain it at, at a level that makes sense that, uh, you know. So, so speaking of, is the target audience uh, more on the undergraduate side or on the graduate student side, postdoc, all of the above? All of the above would be good. We're thinking about undergrads and grad students who have had enough exposure to basic physics to be able to follow the content, but mm -hmm. we're not requiring at all that a reader have deep familiarity with general relativity because we try to provide what's necessary along the way. Cool. Cool. So, so uh, unlike other relativity books, uh, mm -hmm. you know, 
we, we don't put a tremendous amount of uh, emphasis on differential geometry and uh, topology or set theory or advanced mathematical techniques that are for sure super useful to understand and really become an expert in general relativity. But uh, you don't necessarily need to master in order to understand what the excitement is regarding gravitational wave science and how to use some of those results, uh, like to do astrophysics or, or fundamental physics. So. Very cool. And that, I think, is going to bring us to this very awesome ebook, which just came out pretty recently. Gravitational Waves in Physics and Astrophysics, an Artisan's Guide. And Cole and Nico, take us away. All right. Well, Nico, would you like to talk about one of the most enjoyable aspects of this, which is the characters? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, I as professors uh, of physics, we, we had had to go through a good share of, of textbooks when we were learning gravitation, astrophysics, uh, relativity. And um, as professors, we have also taught this material <laughs> multiple times. And we found that it was necessary to uh, find a way to um, convey the questions that uh, either we uh, had when we were learning the material or that students uh, had uh, when we were teaching these courses or that other colleagues had when we were presenting these uh, sort of simple examples at conferences and whatnot. And so we started thinking, like, how do we do this? How do we do this, right? Like if we just like write prose, it just gets very verbose and, and very long and sort of tedious and it's hard to, to break, uh, uh, you know, the, the tone up a little bit and, and, and to make it uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I remember, so, so Cole had, uh, had this character that appears in his uh, graduate classes sometimes uh, that uh, is quite interesting because he's always uh, trying to come up with uh, crazy ideas to, to prove Cole wrong or the students wrong. And I thought, like, oh, that's a cool character. We should, you know, definitely have him appear in the book. And then I thought, like, well, but you know, there's also times when, uh, you know, the question or the interruption shouldn't necessarily be about a crazy idea or something that's obviously wrong. Maybe sometimes it's just like a clarifying thing, where like, you know, a, a character. Uh, needs to come in to provide some sort of physical explanation or a character needs to come in and provide some sort of more rigorous mathematical definition. Because, you know, sometimes some students are going to be very mathematically inclined, others are going to be very physics uh, inclined. Right. Uh, and so we thought, like, wouldn't it be great to have these three different characters? A oh, cool. Captain cool. Obvious that will come in and provide, like, physical intuition for the problem then another character called Major Pain that brings in the mathematical rigor ah. to, to, to the scene. And a third character called Dr. I Am Wrong, okay. which uh, brings in sort of crazy ideas uh, about uh, whether what we are presenting in the book makes sense or, or, or whether we're being sloppy or whatever. And so we, we used these characters throughout the entire book and they keep Very on cool. making appearances and breaking the, the prose uh, yeah. and the discussion so as to introduce uh, different mm -hmm. concepts in different ways uh, through boxes. And so we have a little about the characters at the beginning that describes who these characters are. Uh, we actually constructed biographies for them. <laughs> so <laughs> both Captain Army and Major Payne are in the military. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have some mathematicians that like to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and so we've interspersed uh, these boxes th throughout the book. In a sense, it, 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 it's reminiscent a little bit of, uh, this is a box structure of uh, Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler, this classic textbook on gravitation, mm -hmm. which yep. uses sometimes boxes uh, mm -hmm. to go in depth into particular mm -hmm. subtopics. Mm -hmm. um, Yep. That's not quite what we're doing. Uh, it's a little bit different. It's more of a pedagogical tool to add clarifying comments or, yeah. or emphasis on, on particular topics, as opposed to trying to go into a long tangent uh, of, of a related topic. But, you know, it's a right. similar idea. That's a great device. Uh, yeah. Writing device. That's very cool. So we got three. Okay. Very good. And Mr. Payne is going to take over chapters one and two. 
<laughs> well, I'd say uh, that I, I guess that would be me if I'm Mr. Payne. Yes. So the, the, the book in general is something where we have, I guess you could call it three different groupings. The first four chapters are about the basics of gravitational radiation. The next four are about different applications. Mm -hmm. And then we have three appendices to go into certain aspects in a little bit more detail. And something that both Nico and I wanted to emphasize absolutely everywhere we could is intuition. We want people to be able to reason their ways through. Obviously, if you want to be a practitioner of things, the exact formula and whatnot can be helpful, but we want people to be able to say to themselves, how should this work? So as an example, if we think about chapter one, So this is the overview of gravitational radiation. Mm -hmm. And what we began with is we talk about radiation in general. How can you have radiation? And we use arguments. And by the way, none of these are original to us. We're trying to collect things. But we use arguments saying that based on certain symmetry principles, conserved quantities, that you cannot have monopolar or dipolar gravitational radiation, assuming general relativity is correct. Then we go from that to say, given that this is the case, what can generate gravitational radiation? And there are things that somebody new to the subject might find interesting and surprising. For example, if you have a core collapse supernova that is completely spherically symmetric, it emits zero gravitational radiation, even though energetically, it's just an amazingly bright Mm -hmm. event. So this type of thing to try to break things into those uh, discussions. And as Nico indicated, we throw in Captain Obvious when we believe that there can be a good heuristic or physical insight. We put in Major Payne, who often comes off as a little irritated, I have to admit, where Major Payne is able to explain the way it really is mathematically. And another thing that we do in each of these chapters, as you can see there, is we have exercises just because, as we know, there's nothing like having exercises to help people out. (laughs) And we try to be creative in our exercises, not just put formula 1.3 into 1.7 and prove 1.9, but we have different things like, for example, is the earth in danger of spiraling into the sun because of emission of gravitational radiation and those calculations. Mm -hmm. And as you can also see the useful books at the end of each chapter, we have other possible references. Then chapter two, is where we go from the the real fundamentals to thinking about the types of sources. And as you know, the community has collectively decided that there are four categories of sources. One is binaries, where we have in fact only seen gravitational radiation directly from binaries. You have continuous wave sources like a mountain on a neutron star spinning around. You have burst sources like a core collapse supernova that has some asymmetries. Yes. Then you have stochastic sources, which are the collection of sources individually undetectable, but then can make a a detectable wide frequency band background, like the collection of double white dwarfs in our galaxy, or maybe something from the early universe. Mm -hmm. So those are the first couple of things that we do to lead into the fundamentals. Very cool. Uh, yeah, I'll just pick up your, your motion there on some of this may not be original, but that's okay. It's like standing on the shoulders of giants, right? We all, we hope so. Progress on. We hope we're not, we hope we're not at least falling from the shoulders of giants. <laughs> and it's, I, I would also add that, um, you know, it's, it's not just, um, that people that haven't seen this material before might find, uh, the content useful necessarily. Uh, but also uh, maybe people that have studied general relativity before. Um, they have taken courses on gravitation or on astrophysics. Mm-hmm. Um, this, this take that we, that we, we, uh, that we have uh, on the material is, uh, it might be fresh to some people. We, we really try to uh, teach students how to come up with Fermi estimates. That, yes. That's a theme yes. that goes through the yes. book, right? Uh-huh. And, the reason we do that is because it seems like the uh, art of the Fermi estimate has gotten a bit lost <laughs> nowadays, uh, at least uh, in, in recent years when, yeah, when we try to, uh, so, so I, I have like in my group uh, meetings, we do this thing called a creativity session mm-hmm. once a semester. And during the creativity session, 
I ask the students to come up with an idea of a project that they think they could work on. Uh, that they that is different from anything that they are working on right now. This means they need to read the literature, they need to think about something new to work on, and then see if somebody else has done it. But also implicit in that is that they should actually sort of think about whether it's doable and mm -hmm. what the answer should be <laughs> to their little problem. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. sometimes it's it's difficult for them because they always think of like, oh, well, you know, if I want to know the answer to this problem, then I surely what I need to do is I need to solve the full Einstein equations. And, uh, you know, once I do that carefully to uh, very high order in perturbation theory, I'll be able to come up with an answer. figures at least. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And sometimes when you're exploring new ideas, uh, you can realize that, you know, the answer to the question is, is uh, going to be zero to like many significant digits without doing a single like real calculation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, maybe you shouldn't spend the next six months computing things to to fourth order in perturbation theory. And so how do you teach that? That's that's quite complicated. Um, and how and how do you how do the students learn and where would they learn to do this, right? So so I think I guess we do a little bit of that in physics, uh, you know, two eleven like the first physics courses in every university. Uh, uh, but then it's sort of lost, right? Then we teach them yeah. mechanics and we say like, here's a Lagrangian. <laughs> Once you have the Lagrangian, you can do all these things. You can complete yes. the equations of motion, and then you know, and then you can solve them. I mean. The equations of motion always turn out to be some sort of harmonic oscillator, and then, and you can solve them because that's a one differential equation and how oh, to solve. One. <laughs> and then we tell them, oh, but also there's this thing called the Hamiltonian. And look, if mm -hmm. you take this like variational uh, derivatives, then you also get equations of motion. And again, they turn out to be harmonic oscillators. So again, you can solve. Always. And then we quantize all of that, and then <laughs> we treat uh, a bunch of those things together in some statistical way, and. And it gets more and more technical, more and more mathematical as a student yes, mm -hmm. uh, goes from, like, say, freshman physics to, to senior mm -hmm. level physics. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's natural, right? Once you get to general relativity or astrophysics, things are so mu much more com mathematically complicated. The, the, their first intuition is just to use all of this machinery that they developed to solve the problem. And, and at least, when, you know, when, when, when we uh, help students prepare for the qualifying exam or the preliminary mm -hmm. examinations, or something they're called the comprehensive examinations, um, when we uh, you know ask them to solve problems on the board, we're always hoping that they will come up with quick, you know, insightful ways to see what the answer is. An order of magnitude. Give me the order of magnitude. Uh, will the Earth like fall into the sun or not? Uh, right. Sometimes. Uh, <laughs> and, so, and so that's what we try to do. That's why Captain Obvious is so important to try to provide some sort of heuristic understanding of what the problem is uh, right. and arrive at some general conclusions without needing major pains, mathematical uh, machinery to get the, yeah. the detailed answer. I mean, I'm not going to be wrong. Like sometimes you do need the math. I mean, often, often, <laughs> in fact, when you're comparing to data, you want well, to well, have yeah. a, as precise a model as possible, right? And that will yeah. require that you are careful with with your mathematics and with the orders of the perturbation and things like that. But often you can get to the bottom of the physics of what's going on without doing those detailed calculations. Yes. Um, so so we achieve that by bringing this idea of Fermi estimates over and over and over again. So we good. say, for example, that's awesome. Uh, Very good. With uh, chapter three, where we talk about approximations, like, you know, how do we approximate the solution to the Einstein equations when you have two objects moving around each other. Well, if they're very far away from each other, you can use a uh, small velocity expansion called Poisson-Newton approximations and explain that a little bit. Yep. When um, the objects get really close to each other, then you have to use numerical techniques. Those are also approximations and yep. we explain a little bit of that. Then when one of the objects is much smaller than the other, then you can use an expansion in the mass ratio. And that's called an extreme mass ratio in spiral. We explain mm -hmm. that. And then uh, after the objects merge, then you have essentially a set of, uh, you, you have a, a black hole that's ringing down. And this ring down can be described uh, through uh, something called quasi-normal modes, which are very much like normal mm -hmm. modes of a string. Yep. And so we explain that. Very and cool. you know, when we get to quasi-normal, how do you compute the frequency of the quasi-normal mode? And so we come up with many different ways in which you can get an approximate expression for the frequency. Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> without actually having to solve the linear Einstein equations, which we then, of course, also explain. And as you go to higher and higher levels of sophistication in your mathematics, you get closer and closer and closer to the answer. But if uh, often the, the zero order level of sophistication already gives you a sense of what the right answer is. Oh, yeah. Uh, and yeah. that's what we, what, what we try to do. Uh, throughout the book. And so in, in chapter four, we do more of the data analysis uh, formulation. You know, once you have these models that you develop in section three, in chapter three, then how do you use those models to compare against the data? Um, and this is a chapter that uh, also requires an appendix <laughs> because there's a lot of, this book is not about data analysis, but data analysis itself could be like three separate books. Oh, absolutely. Um, a, yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. I think Cole had something like the seven scenes of statistical analysis or something like that, that yeah. we put it to an appendix. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Very good. I just want to pick up one thing here on the, you know, sort of uh, the lost art of, of approximations. Um, I actually do this in my, uh, uh, I teach an undergrad course uh, called Energy in Everyday Life. And these are for non-science majors. And the only thing we do in that class is estimate. So I want them to get comfortable, even though they're not even science majors, to get comfortable with their intuition on estimating certain things. And so, um, yeah, I can appreciate applying that principle to gravitational waves. Um, and for physicists in particular, should be good at that order of magnitude estimate stuff. So okay. very good. Sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to break that in. <laughs> no, we agree. And we know that it's easy to overcomplicate things. And very being able good. to build the intuition mm -hmm. actually is another way of building confidence that mm -hmm. you're not just approaching something which is a, a mysterious set of spells that must be pronounced in a certain way. You can actually reason it out in many circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And then into, so then the last three chapters or well, four chapters um, are about sort of applications okay. of gravitational wave science. So cool. we divided that into astrophysics, cosmology, mm -hmm. nuclear yeah. physics, yeah. and uh, fundamental physics. Um, so Cole, since you are the astronomer uh, <laughs> in the collaboration, you're the one that actually knows the astrophysics real well. <laughs> you want to talk about chapter five? Yeah, one of the most exciting things to me, even many years ago, thinking about the prospects for gravitational wave observations, was what we would learn astrophysically. And in some sense, I guess you could say that scientists in general are greedy, but it's of the type that Gordon Gecko would say that greed is good, meaning that, yes, you've already now detected gravitational waves, champagne pops, a Nobel Prize is awarded, but you're not going to just sit there and say, we're done. We want to know more and more and more. How can we learn about the universe? And it is genuinely a new window. For example, something that has been quoted by a number of people is that when you have two comparable mass black holes merged in that last little bit of the merger, mm -hmm. the amount of luminosity total that they're emitting is tens of times more than the combined luminosity of every visible star in the universe. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we are missing minor stuff. Yep. And so with that in mind, it has already been the case that through the O3 set of observations for mm -hmm. LIGO and Virgo and Cagra, it has now been possible to learn things about black holes, about neutron stars, to have new questions that we can ask, which is always a good sign about the field, that it is mm -hmm. a productive field. So in this particular case, we again break things into the four categories of sources. Obviously binaries get the primary role because we have seen a number of them. Yep. And here we can break them into what can we learn right now from stellar mass binaries. So you have say black holes or neutron stars from a few solar masses to a few tens of solar masses and they come together. And what can you learn about their origin? What can you learn about other things as well which we'll learn later like fundamental physics. What about if you have two massive binaries mean millions of solar masses or more from the centers of galaxies for right. black holes. Mm -hmm. In that case, we can't see these with the current ground-based detectors because the frequency is wrong. But with something like the pulsar timing arrays, of which there are three around the world, uh -huh. this is something where we can get an indication of the collective effect, indeed a stochastic background. And we may be able to see possibly with that or possibly with LISA, individual cases where you have supermassive black holes spiraling. What's the astrophysics that comes into that? Or 
what if you have a supermassive black hole to, and you have a stellar mass black hole? Okay. Well, in that case, you have an extreme mass ratio in spiral, and this can tell you a great deal of additional astrophysics. And then similarly, we want to know about the non-binary sources. If you have the continuous things like a mountain on a neutron star or things like R modes on neutron stars, oh, right. we can learn about fluid motions. We can learn about perturbations. For burst sources, if there is a core collapse supernova in our galaxy that is caught in gravitational waves, this gives us a new cut on data that's going to be a treasure for people who study these extremely complex events. So stochastic backgrounds, we have things like double white dwarf binaries in our galaxy. A lot of people believe that these are the progenitors of type 1a supernovae of cosmology fame. And then in addition to all of that, you have the lure and the possibility of a very early universe background, say inflationary era. Mm -hmm. B-mode in the cosmic microwave background. Mm -hmm. We talk about all this. Mm -hmm. And along those lines, for when it comes to cosmology, we do our best to give the absolutely essential little bits about cosmology itself. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about different sources, especially stochastic backgrounds, where you can have the early universe, you can have possibly quantum fluctuations, cosmic strings, the sky's the limit. Nothing has been detected yet, but as we say, <laughs> if any one of these can be demonstrated with an absolutely convincing way, then a trip to Stockholm awaits. But then we also have the idea of using gravitational waves to measure the universe. People have talked about this as a way of getting a different handle on the Hubble parameter, okay. and then even going beyond that, and especially for the space-based generation, looking at more massive black holes, maybe we can get ways of determining aspects of dark energy, the self-calibrating aspect of two black holes merging within general relativity may make that possible. Yeah. So what we're trying to do here is not only give the background necessary, but also to give an idea of the excitement of all of this opening up because of the uh, era of gravitational waves. Very cool. Yeah, and so then we move on to nuclear physics and fundamental physics. So, so here we talk about, you know, how can we use gravitational waves to learn about the form of matter the state of matter inside neutron stars where the pressures are immense and the energy densities are humongous as well. And so we talk a little bit about how neutron stars form, how they were discovered. We talk about uh, Joseph mm -hmm. Bell um, and you know how at one point pulsars were uh, thought that, well, there was a hypothesis that there were signals sent to us by aliens, right? And, and how little green men LGM. and how uh, that hypothesis was ruled out pretty fast. <laughs> um, and so there's a bit of a historical, hist a few historical notes there. And then we talk about Chandrasekhar mass and, and how, it, uh, why is it that neutron stars are sort of unavoidable in general relativity once you have uh, objects that are massive enough. And then more importantly, you know, once you have the waves, the gravitational waves, you know, how are the properties of the neutron star encoded in gravitational waves emitted by two neutron stars spiraling into each other and then merging. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what chapter seven is about. And then chapter eight is about tests of general relativity. You know, why is it that, uh, you know, that what is your profession there just means like, you know, <laughs> as physicists, uh, we sometimes forget that our job is not just to always, uh, you know, work with the status quo equations, but we know our equations are incomplete in some sense. There are, there are certain problems with unification and so on. So our job is really to test our hypothesis, our, mm -hmm. our can canonical model. Um, and even though general relativity has, of course, been super successful uh, and, you know, may continue to be successful in, in the near future, it's still our job to use the data that we have, the new data, to uh, verify that it continues to be correct. And so we talk about how do we do that with gravitational waves and what constraints can you place on the generation and then the propagation of gravitational waves? Right. Or, you know, how do we know that the things, the black things that are super massive, well, not super massive, but very massive and merging into each other, producing gravitational waves, how do we know that those things are black holes and not some other exotic object? Fair enough. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's, that's what mm -hmm. chapter eight uh, is. And that closes the book, I guess. Very cool. Cool. Yeah, and I'll say about chapter seven, one interesting aspect of this is that 
for most of the chapters, it was either primarily Nico or primarily me. For example, he was the main architect of chapter eight on fundamental physics, and I was the main writer for chapter five on astrophysics. However, when it comes to gravitational waves to nuclear physics, we have both done extensive work on this. Yep. So that whereas with the other chapters, it'd be like, hey, Nico, I don't understand what you mean. It would be more like, hey, Nico, I think we should do it a different way. So these were both complementary approaches to writing the chapters, but it would have had a, an interesting different flair at that stage. Mm -hmm. So to conclude the book, we have three appendices. The first one is on Bayesian statistics. Ooh. And we're trying as in the entire rest of the book to get people to understand things. We know that Bayesian statistics is understood by most people to be a very rigorous approach to doing inference from data. Mm -hmm. But because of that, and because there are a lot of packages that exist, people mm -hmm. often will slip into just using black boxes. So we ask no, people to no, think no. hard about what they're doing and try to give them a real sense of why. And we had fun coming up with many examples. Appendix B is about dynamics. This just gives some details because there's a lot of dynamics that is important in some of the astrophysics we might infer. So we give some more detail there. And then Appendix C is talking about things like computing aspects of neutron stars. Mm. Uh, so uh, Nico and Kent Yagi at the University of Virginia uh -huh. have done a lot of outstanding work in trying to understand the in some sense, hidden relations between different macroscopic properties of neutron stars. So we want to give enough information there that people can follow that if they wish. Very nice. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So hopefully people will enjoy the book. It's a different take on gravitational right. waves and uh, you know the applications to this variety of topics with a very strong emphasis on Fermi estimates. Uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. So. Uh, yeah, I think this is going to be an awesome book. And you guys are both characters anyway, so I'm sure your characters shine through perfectly fine in this one. <laughs> All the characters are completely made up. And <laughs> any course. similarity with real people is not intentional. Oh, okay, here, here comes here comes the standard disclaimer. <laughs> yes. Well, but it, it was a great deal of fun to write that and to also have the characters interacting with themselves and sometimes get annoyed at us, the authors. Uh, yeah. There you go. Very cool. Cole, Nico, thank you so much for walking us through this uh, brand new ebook. Very nice. Our pleasure. Um, and you touched on it a little bit, and I'll just poke on it here a little bit. Um, uh, you know, where, where do we go from here over, let's say, the next two to five years? Can you see the, um, the field progressing enough where in five years you'll be writing volume two of this with a whole new cast of characters um, and new chapters? Uh, or just, you know, where, where do you think we go or the gravitational field goes, let's say over the next two to five years? We hope that it's difficult to predict because that's the most exciting thing. The 04 run of LIGO and Virgo and CAGRA is coming up at the end of this year or possibly the beginning of next. Yep. As you know, LIGO India within that five-year period should be available and that's going Ooh. to add new depth and precision electromagnetic follow-ups. Obviously, we're hoping for the unexpected. It has already occurred. And if there is enough unexpected, then possibly volume two will indeed be in the works. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, we can only uh, hope that something revolutionary is actually discovered and we all can like, you know, try to learn more about the universe that way. Uh, there, will, there will be uh, probably an impasse uh, at some point, you know, we will continue to observe gravitational waves. Uh, and then, uh, you know, maybe seven years from now, the instruments may, may be taken down to like make more severe upgrades. Yeah. And if that happens, then that might be a good time uh, to sit down and consider <laughs> a new edition or a volume two of this textbook, uh, depending. I mean, I think a lot of things will uh, have changed in the next seven years and then they will, you know, what we have written uh, will, will be sort of the foundation of what has been, uh, what will be uh, done, but maybe new discoveries will be made and we'll learn more about the question of state or about astrophysics or about tests of PR. And that might require uh, you know, an update. And so we can only hope. And among other things, we're hoping that the pulsar timing arrays will have definite d discoveries by that point. There are already got some very interesting hints. And in the five-year uh -huh. time period, I think there's an excellent chance that they'll be able to claim victory. Mm, new chapter on PTAs. I like there it. There you go. There you go. <laughs> 
And with any luck, then we'll get a galactic supernova with neutrinos and gravitational emission and all of it. We'll get the whole nine yards there. That'd be awesome. Trust me. <laughs> cool. Nico, thank you so much once again. And that will do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.